prompt about the recording. All right, well, welcome everyone. Um, happy to have you here for the EDD information session um, in the Higher Education and Student Affairs Program. Um, I'm Amy Barnes, and I have a slide that says so. Um, <laughs> and I'm the director of the program. I'm a faculty member in the Higher Education and Student Affairs Program. Um, and I teach a lot of leadership related courses, um, but then I have responsibilities for directing this program um, in its entirety. So I'm going to let Megan introduce herself. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, my name is Megan Tuttle. I'm the admissions specialist for the department. So I handle all things applications. Um, I'll talk a little bit about applications today, but I'm your main contact if you have questions throughout the process. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to kick us off and just talk a little bit about the highlights of the program. So when we designed this program, we designed it specifically for working professionals. So our courses are offered in the evening, assuming that you have a full-time job during the day. Um, a few are online. I get this question a lot, like how much of the program is online. Honestly, we did kind of kick it up a little bit with COVID in terms of the faculty offering online course options. They definitely got a little better at it <laughs> over that time period, but the majority of our classes are still meeting in person um, now that we're back from COVID. And so um, we do have a few online and we try to actually do more online offerings in the summer because we find that our EDD students appreciate having a little bit more flexibility in the summer um, to plan around family vacations and those kinds of things. Um, it is a part-time degree, so we do plan for you to have a part-time pace. Um, it takes four years to do that. You take two classes at a time every semester, including summer, um, in that four-year time period. And um, there is a possibility for accelerating to a three-year program if you take more classes, if you take some classes before you start the program as a grad non-degree student, things like that. There are kind of magically ways to make that happen. I usually handle those with students on a case-by-case -case basis. So if that's something that you're interested in, definitely reach out and let me know. Um, in the spring of your third year is when you take your professional comprehensive exams, which is basically tied in. It's basically your um, proposal for your dissertation and practice project, which I will talk more about in a minute. Um, and I just want to highlight, too, that faculty in this program are committed to this practical focus of training scholar practitioners for the field of higher education. Um, it's We consider it different from how we train our PhD students um, as researchers. And so while research is a, is a piece of this program, it is much more practically focused overall. Um, required courses, this just will kind of give you a sense for the types of courses that we offer in the program. Um, our pro seminar, which is there at the top, is actually a required course across all 13 programs that we currently have in educational studies. All the doctoral students take those classes together. Um, and actually, it's those first two, and that's in your first year. And then you kind of start going into these other courses that are HESA specific. Um, and these courses, oftentimes, you are taking those with your cohort. So there may also be PhD students in the class, but your entire EDD cohort would be all together. Uh, for these, it is a cohort-based program. Um, and then once you make it through these required courses and you're taking um, research classes, cognate classes, and electives, that is when you have a little bit more choice and you might not be necessarily with your cohort, although there are likely other EDD students taking similar classes to you, if that makes sense. Um, but you may have an opportunity also to take courses with students who are in different years of the EDD program from you, um, so different cohorts at that time as well. So every doctoral degree at Ohio State requires a final research document, um, and ours is what's called a dissertation in practice, uh, because we wanted to make it distinct and different from a PhD dissertation. Um, that is actually kind of a a best practice that's coming down from an organization called the Carnegie Project for the Educational Doctorate, CPED is what the short acronym spells. Um, and it's an organization that is trying nationally to encourage EDD programs to make themselves unique from PhD programs. Um, too many EDD programs across the country look very similar to PhD programs and kind of are being considered PhD light, which is not what we wanted at all uh, for our program. We wanted it to be rigorous um, in a different way, right, from for a different purpose for folks. So 
You're not going to be doing a traditional dissertation in this program. However, it is still a robust research project. And we're, we have designed a consulting project. So you will be um, partnered with an office, either at Ohio State or another neighboring institution. We haven't gone outside of Columbus yet. I don't know that we're going to, but um, there's enough higher education institutions around here um, to give some great experiences for our students. So we partner up with an office that meets the interest areas of the students. So I do some surveying of the students about what is it that you would like to maybe be challenged by in this final project? What are the topics that are interesting to you at this stage of your program? I usually ask that in about year three. And so I kind of know what students' interests are and I go in search of consulting sites and offices that would have um, problems of practice that they could explore as part of that. So, um, with that, I, I put them in groups of three, usually three to four students together in the same group. Um, they, it is not, however, a group project. You are all tackling the same problem of practice that that office is struggling with, but you all can tackle it from your own lens, your own angle. You can look at it with a different population from your peers in the group. Um, so I'll give you an example. We did uh, project with our honors and scholars program last year. They had done a strategic plan where they had some new equity, diversity, and inclusion um, goals. And they were trying to find out more about what their students needed um, and how they could improve in those areas. So we had one student who interviewed um, students of color in the honors program. We had another who looked at transfer and campus change students coming to the Columbus campus or to Ohio State from another institution who did not decide to join the honors program and were either first generation or students of color and kind of thinking about why that was, because there's definitely a, a break there in communication somewhere <laughs> on those transfer and campus change students. Um, we had one do a survey of first generation students in the honors program. And then we had one student who specifically wanted to look at the um, experiences of Black students deciding whether they wanted to join the honors program or not. Um, so had some that did and some that didn't, but we was really asking questions about that decision-making process. And it, they just came up with so much great data across all four of their projects, which were not the same, um, but were kind of all addressing that problem from that broader perspective. So the office was great. Um, and actually one of those students has already uh, published his um, findings in a practical journal. So great work by that group. Um, again, that is linked to your exams. You basically start the process when you start your exam, um, which I think is helpful. It's all kind of tied together. And your final, your committee, because all doctoral um, students have committees at the end of their program that kind of evaluate their final projects. Those committees um, are different from PhD committees in that they include two faculty members instead of three. And that third person is an administrator on that committee who has a terminal degree in the field and who works at Ohio State. Um, and that's been a great experience for our students as well to have that committee member be a practically focused person. Um, I get this question a lot. So, and I've mentioned it a little bit, but what is the difference between the EDD and the PhD? And this is how we see it. Again, if you go apply to a different institution, you might get a different answer to this question because every institution is kind of evaluating their programs differently. But for us, the EDD is practice oriented while the PhD is research oriented. Um, the day-to-day -day experience looks different. You know, the day-to-day -day experience of our EDD students is that they're going to work during the day and they're coming to class from work, right? So they have that work lens on right when they walk in the door. And then we're reading current research and we're talking about you know current issues and classes that are impacting higher education and those EDD students are bringing that work lens and it's really cool um, because our EDD students come from all different areas of higher education and so we can really dig in and tackle um, those pro those problems from real live experience that people are having right in their jobs and that has just created a very vibrant classroom experience not to say that PhD students can't do that too, but PhD students spend their days, they're usually full-time students, first of all, but they're usually spending their days writing, uh, researching, reading, um, and really digging in, you know, to that empirical research as part of their experience. Um, so they're publishing, right? They're on research teams with faculty. That's different, right? That they have a different end in mind. 
um, for what they're trying to accomplish. So that's a distinct difference. Um, obviously, the final project is different, as I already mentioned. So those are kind of the distinct ways if you're thinking about which program you are suited for, um, be thinking about those differences. Also, we don't allow people to apply to both programs. You have to choose um, because we think that you should know your end goal. By the time you're making a big decision like a doctoral program, um, you know, you should probably have thought through this at that point and kind of know um, which track you would like to pursue. If you want to talk that out, though, I'm happy to be a sounding board uh, for folks. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to Megan to talk a little bit about the application, and we'll definitely have time for questions at the end. Awesome. Thank you, Amy. Um, so with the application, um, the requirement, the required documents are a statement of purpose. Um, the HESA program does ask for specific questions to be answered. Um, so be sure to take a look at the website, um, specifically the program website, and I'll also drop that in the chat. There are four specific questions that they're seeking you to answer within your statement of purpose. Um, we're also looking for a resume or CV. It can be either or. Um, and then transcripts. So transcripts can sometimes take a moment. If you've done post-secondary work in high school, those types of classes also need to be included. Um, so give yourself some time if you're able. Um, the deadline to apply is December 1st. Um, so we always recommend starting early, giving yourself as much time as possible to get those transcripts. Um, and then finally, uh, three letters of recommendation. So the letters of recommendation, once you submit your application, it prompts an email to go out from our admissions team um, to the email addresses that you will provide. And that is where the people writing those letters uh, will upload via the link they receive in that email. Um, so it does take roughly 24 to 48 hours um, from your submission of your application for that link to be sent. Um, so do practice some patience. If you have questions, you're welcome to reach out to me, um, but they'll be getting that link um, within a day or two. Um, and for this specific program, we are looking for um, at least one of those letters. It can be an additional letter if you'd like, but it can be one of your three letters of recommendation um, being from your current supervisor. Um, there are some uh, demands from this program, so we just want to make sure that your supervisor is on board with um, you being involved. I'll also just add that if you work at Ohio State, your supervisor actually has to sign off on you taking classes every single semester. So that's kind of why that's in there is we just need to know that they that you have their blessing. Um, as Megan said, if you want to have that be an additional one, that's fine. Um, I also recommend sometimes that you apply early to be sure that you have time to get those letters of recommendation. So if you can get your application done by say November 15th, right, then that gives you a couple of weeks to give your recommenders to make sure that things are turned in. It doesn't have, they don't all have to be in by December 1st, but it will get your application read more quickly if they're there. So that's always good. Thanks, Megan. Yeah, absolutely. And I did see a question pop up in the chat. Um, if any of your transcripts are Ohio State transcripts, we will already have that information available to us. If you applied for a degree at OSU and you submitted transcripts when you applied, that can be a different situation. Uh, there are record retention policies that the university adheres to. Um, so each case might be unique for whether or not your transcript from an external um, university is still on file. Um, our graduate and professional admissions team will be able to take a look at your specific account to confirm whether we still have that transcript or whether it will need resubmitted. Um, and I'll provide that information as well for you. Yeah, so uh, just highlighting the application timeline here. Again, the deadline is December 1st of 2022. Um, we do have a bit of a leeway about about two weeks where we'll still accept those final letters of recommendation and transcripts. Um, but we do encourage you again to apply early so that we can get those in and get this in front of our faculty members for review as soon as possible. Um, we do have, we do accept those um, documents up until December 15th. That is the final date that we're going to take a look to make sure that they're there. Um, so make sure you have everything in at the very minimum by that date. Um, so applications will then begin reviewing in uh, January. The uh, program here does do interviews. Um, so Amy will coordinate with um, a staff member to get those sent out to you in about February. 
and then you can expect decisions in roughly March. So how to apply. So um, our application is listed in our GP admissions website. Um, it's listed here, but I'll also throw that link in the chat for you. Um, and you'll want to look, this is actually the Educational Studies Doctor of Education program. Um, so within the application, that's where you'll note that you're applying for the HESA program. Um, and then you'll, you'll initially search though for the Doctor of Education here. Um, so you, again, Amy reiterated here that you do want to choose, you want to know whether or not you want to pursue the EDD or the PhD. Um, again, you can speak with Amy or you can connect with our team and we can also discuss the, the variations between those two options just to make sure we're getting you to your end goal as well. Um, so if you've applied at OSU before, um, if it's only been undergrad, you're going to be a new uh, applicant. Uh, so that makes it easy you know which route to go. Um, if you've had a graduate degree, if you've enrolled in graduate um, work here at OSU before, you'll be a returning or former student. Um, these are pretty well laid out as you're working through the application as well, um, but just for additional context, we like to walk through it. Um, and then obviously, if you're enrolled in courses, you'll be a current graduate student. Um, so each of those options will kind of guide you to how you apply through the application. So again, um, it does take about 24 to 48 hours for the system to capture your application. Um, I'll be the first person that sees your application when it first comes in and I send you a confirmation email um, just saying, you know, we've been received, it's being processed. And um, that also provides you a link to our applicant center. Um, I highly recommend in, um, logging in into your applicant center. That gives you a view of what is still required on your application. Um, it'll mark when your letters of recommendation have been submitted. So it is your best place to check in and make sure uh, that your application is still getting everything that it needs. Um, you're also welcome to reach out to me. I'll take a look at your application as well if you have questions. Um, so your recommenders, as Amy stated, um, takes about 24 hours for them to get that email. So again, just uh, have some patience, um, but they will receive that email as soon as you submit. Um, you do have to get to submit versus save. So those are two different options. So make sure that um, you're submitting the application at the end. Um, again, double check the spelling on your letter of recommendation emails, um, that often can throw things off. We can take a look at it after the fact, um, but to ensure that you don't have a delay in getting those submitted, um, that is a great place to check for any errors before you hit the submit button. Um, it's also common with OSU emails when we're sending out and it's an external um, email address, it can often go to the spam um, folder. So if you are hearing from someone who's writing your letter of recommendation that they have not yet received this request, um, have them take a look there first. Uh, nine times out of 10, that's where they'll find it. Um, but if not, uh, feel free to reach out to our GP admissions team um, and they'll be able to help you help guide you to resending the request. Megan, we have a question in the chat. Um, if they're taking a non-degree seeking class um, during the term they're applying, are they considered a current graduate student or a new graduate student? So graduate non-degree is not actually listed as a degree seeking program. Um, so you would um, be applying as a new student. Yeah, and so um, as I stated, yeah, if you have any troubles with um, the recommenders writing your letters, um, getting that request, um, you can go ahead and reach out to our GP admissions team. Um, they'll help guide you through getting that resent. Um, you also can work with me. Um, you can upload uh, documents after you've submitted your application um, through our application uploader. So there is an option for that. The letters of recommendation do have to come through um, the GP admissions team. So if you have a recommender who's having trouble with the link, um, they'll want to connect through our GPA docs email. Um, and that just verifies that you did not write the letter yourself. Somebody else saw it and they're confirming that it's coming from an, a different email address um, and we're receiving that from an outside person. Yeah, so um, 
I actually just mentioned this. So if you are missing something, um, if you wanted more time to write your statement of purpose, but you wanted to make sure your application submitted so that those writing your letters of recommendation get that email request, um, you can use what's called our admissions uploader and allows you to add those documents after you submit your application. Um, so this works for your resume, CV, um, this works for your statement of purpose, those types of documents for you. Yeah, and um, so tuition, um, if you have questions on tuition, it has been adjusted this year. Um, our office can give some more insight. Um, it is set by the university, um, but this is just kind of a breakdown on what to anticipate. And just if you work at Ohio State and you're planning on using that tuition benefit, um, make sure you talk to the your HR representative. Um, there's a lot of little things that you're gonna need to know. Uh, and they're not necessarily uh, unified across campus. So we don't speak about those. <laughs> we let you talk to your HR folks about those. So if you have questions about that, please reach out to them. Yeah, and um, I have used the um, employee tuition benefit before. It's a wonderful benefit. Um, there is a tax to that if after, um, it might be adjusted each year. Right now, I believe it's set at 5,200, roughly around there, but confirm with your HR specialist. Um, so you'll see um, some taxes pulled from your paycheck after you hit that, that certain plateau. So it's important to keep that an eye on that because you don't want to um, get a paycheck back and you see it's short and you didn't anticipate that. Um, so something just to keep in mind. Yeah, so as we said, um, be sure to talk to your HR rep um, and then applications do it at the uh, deadline of December 1st. Um, we, we do only review completed applications, so make sure that you're monitoring that applicant center that I'll send you the link for um, to make sure that everything is in before you before the deadline date. Yeah, and I'll talk just a second. Like we have a lot of folks who ask, like, what if I took some classes before I apply to the program as a graduate non-degree student? You can definitely do that. Um, you do have to apply as a grad non-degree student at Ohio State. It's a very short application and a small fee. Um, and then once you have grad grad non-degree status, then you can enroll in classes. Um, typically, I recommend folks take electives um, really only in that space because you wanna save those cohort classes to take with your cohort. Um, I've had some very sad EDD students in the past who took those cohort classes early and then didn't experience like the fun bonding, we're all in classes together thing that comes with the cohort experience. So I really recommend that. And I really recommend, it says here, focus on research classes. I don't recommend that either, honestly. I stick with the electives and the cognates. Um, it's a little early to take the research classes before you start. Um, and so if you have questions about that, you can just reach out to me or Lakeisha Mays is the other staff member um, who helps with the EDD program. And she is um, on vacation this week. So um, she, but she's on our, her contact information is on our website. So you can reach out to her as well to kind of get recommendations on what classes might be offered like this spring or next fall, um, depending on when you're applying uh, that you might be interested in taking. Um, and then we do try to get the cohort together in the spring. So once we go through interviews, once we um, make those decisions, we try to um, have some sort of gathering in the spring because technically this program starts in the summer. So um, we try to get everyone introduced and then we kick things off with summer classes um, as well. So again, I mentioned Lakeisha, she's there, <laughs> her contact information, but also her information's on the website. And as Megan said, she's available for um, questions regarding your application as you're kind of going through that process um, if you're applying this December. We do have various ways that you can connect with us via social media, websites. Um, please you know, follow us for, for information um, as you're kind of considering the program. And then now I'm going to open it up for any questions that you might have. Uh, let me ask this. Let me answer the chat first. So, um, so the question is about the length of the statement of intent. I think it's four pages. Does that sound right, Megan? I think that's what I put. <laughs> so now I'm trying to remember. Yeah, I think we try and limit it um, to three to four pages. Um, 
just to make sure that it's digestible for our faculty as they're reviewing. Um, so be cognizant of that, but be sure you're answering uh, the questions thoroughly as well. What other questions do you have? So this is Don. Hi. Hi. So I just have a quick question. On the program page, it mentions the ability to transfer 30 hours from a master's degree program. Is there anything more you can say about that? Is that a case-by-case -case basis? Is that, okay. It's standard practice of all okay. of our doctoral programs. So our, our doctoral programs are technically like 80, 81 credits, depending on the program. Really, it's 50-51 right, or 54, right? That's the actual number of credits you'll take in the program. The other 30 is your master's applied as a, and it doesn't matter how many credits you actually took in your master's program. It comes over as a block of 30 credits regardless. Okay. So if you were like on quarter systems and you took a crazy number of 48 credits or something in your master's program, it still comes over as 30. Does that make sense? That absolutely makes sense. And I, you know, just looking at the multitude of programs out there, like 50, 51, 54 is like the traditional number. And so I just wanted to make sense of it real quick. That's how we do it here. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Good question, though. And yeah. I should have said, too, you can transfer up to 10 additional credits um, that are beyond your master's. So they cannot be a part of your master's degree, right? So I've had students say, well, I took higher ed law in my master's program. Do I have to take higher ed law now? Well, first of all, yes, the law has changed in the last 10 years. So yes, you need to take it. But irregardless, that was part of your master's degree and it counts in those 30. So I can't let you count that also towards your doctoral. Like it's a double dipping situation. So, but if there are classes you've taken since graduating from your master's program or that were in excess of the requirements for your master's degree, then we can talk about whether or not those would apply. So that would be those grad non-degree classes that you perhaps take or something else you've taken at another institution you've worked at. Um, you know, I kind of, like I said, I handle those kinds of questions on a case by case. So if you have that situation and you want to talk it through with me, happy to do that sometime. Yeah, and I'll just jump in to add, um, I support our department in processing the request for the block of 30 hours from your master's degree to be transferred. Um, so if you have specific questions, Amy does a great job of advising how to move through the process to make sure that's formally um, counted by the university. Um, but if you have any specific questions when you get to that point, um, you can also reach out to me as well again for that. I have a very random question. So we work, I work currently with professional students and prior to their um, application um, or area will provide support on strengthening their, um, their statements, right? Is that something your department does so that by the time we submit or a statement of purpose is kind of laser focused or is that cheating? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that I would consider it cheating, but it's not something we've typically done. Um, I will be honest, like I'm looking for the, the questions that are part of that statement of purpose are very targeted questions about what are the problems of practice that you are dealing with in your world, right? Like what are the things that at work uh, you're encountering that you think are you know, troubling, problematic, complex, uh, that need to be addressed and that, you know, research and learning more could potentially help, right? Help you tackle those problems better. And so I'm really just looking for like your sincere interests in those areas, why an EDD is going to help you, why you think an EDD is going to help you with that, right? Um, and what, you know, how does this degree help you move forward in your career? I mean, those are the types of questions that are there for you. And it's really just trying to get a sense for um, you know, your purpose in applying your interest areas, what kinds of questions you're grappling with, what are you seeking more information about through this program? It's like I said, it's very practical. We're very theory to practice. And I want to be able to see that link. Um, so don't stress out too much about it. <laughs> Um, obviously it should be, you know, good writing. So get someone to review it for you, right? Like someone you trust who can do that for you. But, um, yeah, don't, you know, as a practitioner, most, I feel like most times these come somewhat naturally, right? Cause we're, we're asking you to, it's your wheelhouse, right? This is what you do. You do, you practice every day, um, in the field of higher education. And so, you know, this should, this should not be as challenging as maybe like, hey, write this research paper on this topic, right? It's not asking that. Thank you. Any other questions? 
I was just going to say I, I, <clears throat> that helped me a lot, Amy, because something that I was struggling with in the statement of intent is, well, I can think of like 10 different things that I don't know that I could write four pages about but you know, individually, but I feel like if I could talk about all of them and how they relate to what I do on a regular basis, easily I could get to the three to four pages. I don't know if everyone else is feeling that way, but that's kind of the way I, I was feeling when thinking about how to get even started with that. So thank you, that helped, that helped me a lot. Yeah, you can also do, a, I'm not ex expecting extensive research, right? But like you can do a quick Google search, maybe a Google Scholar search on your topic and like learn a teeny bit and include a little, you know, background information on it, um, which would help add to the page, <laughs> page numbers um, as well. So, you know, it doesn't have to be like your best research paper ever kind of context, but just a little knowledge that you share about that topic, right? Um, is it retention of, you know, college students? Is it um, mental health and college students today, right? Is it faculty tenure processes, like whatever it is that interests you, it can be all over the map, right? Um, we've got people who are really excited about athletics in the second year class right now. And so theirs were all about student athletes and those issues. Um, so it's just, it's also fun for me to get a glimpse, right? Of who you are when you're applying in that way. I guess the only other question I had is like, and I, I know there's a minimum, you know, from a qualification perspective that you want the students to come in with. And I don't want to speak ill of anything, but I, I do wonder like how selective are you guys being when you are looking through this? So we don't publish anywhere. We don't have a policy that states like a minimum of five years of experience, right? In higher education. But um, that is the one factor that I think um, sometimes weighs more heavily, right? So if someone's applying right out of a master's program, they've had no work experience, you know, I might say to that student, like, go work for a couple of years, right? Because this program mostly includes 10, 15, 20 years of experience, folks who are kind of mid-level managers, maybe even director level looking to move up, right? In the field of higher education. And so, and bringing that experience is what makes this program so I think special, right? Like the, the wealth of experience that everyone brings to the classroom. Um, so I've certainly, I've admitted people with less than five years of experience, but um, it is something that I like to see, right? Um, I always tell people like, I don't, I, I don't really want this program to be a highly selective program because I think that everyone who applies to this program has a sincere desire to better themselves as a professional. Um, and I think that's, wonderful, right? I'd like to provide that sort of training and, and professional opportunity for folks um, to link, you know, this degree to their experience. We have a limited number of people we can accommodate, right, in the cohort. Um, it's about 12 to 15 every year. And so um, we do deny people. I don't like doing it, but we do. Um, and I always tell those folks, please apply again next year. Like, it's, we're not trying to be like weeding people out or you know, it's just a matter of we're trying to keep our numbers, you know, at a reasonable place where we can give the attention that we need to, to the people who are here. Um, if we had more faculty, I'd bump it up to 30, you know, <laughs> just take lots more. Um, but that's just where we are right now. So um, I don't know if that answers your question, but it, you know, we're making a sincere effort to give people opportunity to, you know, better themselves as professionals through this program. So make that case for yourself um, in the application about how this, this program is going to do that for you. No, absolutely. That answers my question. So good. Thank good. You. Okay. Anything else? Okay. I had a question. In the oh chat. yeah, go ahead. Um, so you mentioned you look for folks with at least five years experience. Um, do you mean five years experience post masters or five years of professional experience in general? Professional experience. Okay. Yeah. So some people go back for their master's after working. That's fine too. Like just some experience working in the field um, is great. So it's, like I said, it's not a hard and fast rule. Everyone will be kind of evaluated differently on that. You know, we'll look at everyone's unique case, but you know, I've told students before, like if you are coming right out of a master's and you've never worked right, you undergrad into master's, never had a professional role. It's not just that 
that we're making that decision based on like your lack of experience. It's also that you might not feel comfortable in the program sometimes because it's, you know, you're, you're there with people who have had so much more experience than you've had. So it's nice to just get a couple years under your belt, I think, before, before applying. And like I said, I have admitted people with less than five years. Um, so it's not a hard and fast rule by any means. So don't let it discourage you from, from trying. <laughs> Okay. Well, please reach out to us individually. Um, if it's, you know, program related questions, I'm happy to take those. Lakeisha can take those. Again, Megan's available for questions regarding the application process. And we hope best of luck to all of you and hope to see your applications here shortly, right? Thanks everyone. Have a great day. Thank you.